Hi, welcome back to Follett, the video book. Uh, today's selection, we're going to finish up chapter 14. And this particular selection is safe as houses. You can share this with anybody. You can listen to it with anybody you like to and not be worried about much of anything. It's, it's well, you'll find out. <laughs> Here we go. Follett turned the car around and headed back toward the interstate. He followed the road under the highway. About five miles later, he turned west toward Rome. About half an hour later, they had reached Rome, the Rome city limits. Follett drove slowly through town, looking for some sign of the dream people. He stopped at a stop sign and looked carefully left and right before proceeding. He had scanned to the left, and just as he had started turning his gaze back, Follett noticed a dark green hearse about two blocks away. A green hearse? It had to be one of Fobator's people. Follett turned left and checked the, each cross street. At the third street, he looked to his right and saw the hearse turning left, and it would be three blocks down. This chase continued for another half an hour until Follett was finally able to pull the caddy in behind the hearse and follow it bumper to bumper. The hearse's driver looked in her rearview mirror and spotted Follett and his caddy. She smiled and waved, and Follett realized that the driver was Marie too, Marie Laveau's daughter, up from New Orleans. Follett hadn't seen Marie too for many years, but the two had had a torrid May-December romance. Follett couldn't help himself from singing their song. I can hear you singing, saying you'll stay beside me. Why must it be that you always creep into my dreams? Mary shot Follett a quizzical look. An old friend from New Orleans is driving the hearse ahead of us. I haven't seen her in years and years, but we shared this song. Mary reached for Follett's bicep and gave it a squeeze. Follett said with a smile, Yes, Mary, you're my main squeeze now and forevermore, and she hit him hard in his upper arm. Ouch, he said. Follett rubbed his arm and followed the hearse through town. They drove for what seemed like miles until they came to a commercial airport on the north side of the city. The hearse went through the big gate and a chain-link fence that surrounded the airfield and then across the tarmac and into a gigantic hangar. Inside were more hearses, but in a rainbow of colors. In addition to the hearses were old-fashioned Cadillac ambulances, 30 or 40 combined. Follett parked next to the green hearse, and when he got out, an older Creole woman with her hair wrapped in a blazingly colored turban ran to meet him. Follett, Follett, I can't believe that you're here, shouted the woman, almost jumping up and down in her excitement. Marie, it's been too long, baby, much, much too long, and Follett pulled the woman into an embrace that was comfortable and affectionate while barely concealing an emotion Mar Mary could only call a hankering. Marie held Follett almost too long until she saw Mary. She smiled and let the snuggle end. And who is this, Follett? Marie asked, never taking her eyes from Mary's. Marie, Follett almost stammered. This is Mary, Mary Diana. Marie moved to Mary and said, I see you are a fortunate one, Follett, to have her in your life, and embraced Mary softly, showing her approval and acceptance of Mary in one gentle touch. Mary was instantly enchanted by this marvelous woman. Thank you, Marie, Mary whispered to her. I have loved your Follett for a very, very long time, Mary, and I cannot help but love those he chooses to love, Marie said as she held Mary's face between her hands. Marie turned to Follett. Follett, Mary, come with me to see Fobator. He will want to talk to you about tonight. Marie led the couple across the hangar, Follett recognizing some of the people present and waving or shouting a greeting. Standing next to a burgundy red convertible that screamed, Sex! From the chrome of the eight individual exhausts snaking out from under the hood to the chrome wire wheels with white wide-wall tires to the British tan convertible top was a distinguished-looking man of indeterminate age. As, Marie, as Mary looked at him, he seemed to be vibrantly alive as a young man of 20, as sophisticated and urbane as an elder in his 60s, and as powerful and self-assured as a man of middle age. Nice ride, Fobator, Follett said as he approached. The man laughed. 1935 Duesenberg S.J. Legrand Duel Cal Phaeton. 6,000 pounds, 12 feet long, supercharged, 320 horsepower, straight eight, 104 miles per hour in second, top speed of 140. I drove up from the city that care forgot to attend to some messy business. I'll be headed back later tonight. It's good to see you too, Follett. I'm glad that you're here. Fobator, this is Mary, said Follett. Ah, Meridiana, a pleasure. Fobator took Mary's hand in his. We've heard about your effect on our Follett from Dave and Alp. Welcome. Mary found herself almost lost in Fobator's eyes as he spoke to her. His words warmed her from her feet to the ends of the hair on her head. 
Mary, may I steal Follett from you for a few minutes? I need him, him to share with me what he knows. I'll return him to you shortly, Fobator said. Mary, would you please introduce Mary to our other friends? Mary, almost everyone here has known Follett for a long time. It's time that you meet his friends. Mary turned to Marie and they walked off arm in arm. Follett watched Mary walk away. Fobator said, Follett, you do lead a charmed life, my friend. Smiled and patted Follett on the back. But for now, please come with me. Fobator led Follett off to a small office at the back of the hangar. The two went inside. Half an hour later, the door to the office opened and the two men walked out and shook hands. Follett left Fobator at the office and the god of nightmares called his children to come to him. Follett found Mary still with Marie sharing a cup of coffee. Thank you for taking care of her, Marie, Follett said, but now I have to take her from you. Mary and I have some work to do before tonight's campaign begins. He embraced Marie and kissed her softly once on her lips, the kiss lasting a split second longer than a kiss between friends. Marie turned to Mary and held her and gave Mary the same kiss that she had given Follett. The three parted and Follett and Mary walked back to the caddy. What does Fobator have in mind for tonight, Follett? The exorcists have taken about 200 dreamers and plan to cast their demons out tomorrow morning at sunrise. They think that is an auspicious time, full of symbolism and power, assholes. So before they can violate, violate those dreamers' innermost sanctums, Fobator and his children will mount an attack that should render the exorcists empty and ineffectual between 3 and 4 a.m., the hour of the wolf, the time when most phantoms are at large and fears of an unknown grow, the hour of the day when there are no church services or prayers which are marked by the canonical hours, Follett explained. You would think that they would expect something then. Maybe it's a trap, Follett, Mary said. We'll find out tonight. Midnight came and went, as did 1 and then 2 a.m. Fobator called his children together and explained what was to come. My darlings, my loves, for the past week, as the exorcists have brought their captives to their perverse prison to be held until their dreams are torn from them, I've sent our friends, the Nue, to plow the field for tonight's harrowing. Tonight I s send you out to plant the terrible seeds that will infest the nights of the dream stealers. Tonight you will mount your steeds and ride to crush these abominations. Fobator stood in front of the mystical multitude, glowing with the passion of his vision. The Nue? Mary asked. The Nui are Japanese chimeras, Follett explained. For over a thousand years they have been Fobator's allies. At their most benevolent, they foretell sickness and bad luck. At their worst, they visit night terrors on their victims. They may have the paws of a tiger, the face of a monkey, the body of a dog with long poisonous snake as a tail, or they may simply appear as a rolling black cloud, delivering horrifying dreams. This is just the first act in Fobator's siege. If the exorcists are overwhelmed before they even suspect that they are threatened, they may give up their pointless perversion and let the dreamers dream and our brothers and sisters do their work. If the exorcists decide not to surrender and to defend the mighty fortress of their fallacy, they will just be, this will just be the first battle of a war. Morpheus, Fobator's brother, delivered a message to the exorcists as soon as he discovered that they were planning a mass exorcism in Rome. If they refused to free their prisoners, there would be war. The exorcists ignored the warning, Follett continued. Fobator stood in front of his dream warriors. He spread his black, great black wings and said, Now it's time for you, my children, to reach out and touch the sleeping perversion that is the exorcists. You will come to them as the terror of their dreams. Mary looked at Follett and moved closer to him. He put his arm around her shoulder and held her tightly. The first of you, my beloved, will ride into their sleep on your horses, some on white horses, bows in your hands, some on red horses, wielding great swords, some on black horses, holding pairs of balances in your hands, some on pale horses, chasing them through their sleep. Some of the enemy will understand and flee, Fobator laid out his plan of attack. For those who ignore these first dreams, he continued, I will trap them in their sleep with a great earthquake, which will move every mountain out of its place. So they beg for rocks and mountains to fall on them to hide them. Their begging will be in vain because I will turn the sun black and the moon as red as blood. I'll make the stars of heaven fall to earth and the sky recede like a scroll being rolled up. For the next assault I have chosen eight of you, my precious ones. Follett saw anger flash in Fobator's eyes as the Lord of Nightmares raised his voice in fury. My golden one will enter first with a golden censer filled with fire and throw it to the ground. There will be peals of thunder, rumblings and flashes of lightning, and the hordes of the dead will rise and walk the dreams of the unconscious. 
Then my golden one's seven siblings, all shining like the sun, will take up their trumpets and call retreat. The first will send hail and fire, mingled with blood, to the earth. The second will pull a great mountain from the sky. The third will draw a great star from heaven to poison the waters. The fourth will darken the sun, the moon, and the stars. The fifth will open a bottomless pit, belching smoke as if from a furnace, from which will crawl great spiders which tail, with tails of scorpions, human faces and hair, and lion's teeth. The sixth will set free terrible angels who will bring plagues of fire, smoke, and brimstone. And the seventh will open the clouds to the heavens, where a great altar made of severed limbs and malformed bodies sits on high. Finally, Obator said, his voice almost a whisper, I will send my dearest daughter into the dreams of the exorcists. She will be clothed in a white robe with a crown of twelve stars on her head, with the sun at her back and the moon under her feet. She will be pregnant with her child. She will spread her arms, and the men who would steal dreams will see everyone they have ever loved fall without end, while greasy, vile sewage slowly drowns them. And if they wake from their wickedness and flee, they will live. If they choose to continue their depravity and steal the dreamer's dreams, they will die. Phobador's rage was palpable. Mary shivered at his passion. Even Follett was stirred by the Lord's words. Then I will send the Mure. The multitude hanging on his every word roared their blessing of this terrible aggression. The Mure? Mary whispered. The Mure were Norse before they came to visit the Anglo-Saxon Britons, Follett explained. They enter a sleeper's house if there is even the smallest opening in the foundation, the walls or the roof. Their approach sounds like the gnawing of a mouse or the quiet creeping of a cat. When they reach their victim, they creep up a sleeping person's body from below, first on the sleeper's feet, next on the wretch's stomach, then on the prey's chest, and finally on the victim's head. The sleeper cannot move a muscle and is crushed. Follett felt Mary shudder and pulled her closer. Come with me, Mary, Follett said. I want to watch this. I'm afraid, Follett, she admitted. I'll take care of you, Mary, Follett said, always. They hopped into the caddy and drove back into town, passing the big concrete convention center, now quiet and dark, waiting for its ceremony at sunrise. There seemed at first glance to be no guards, but Follett pointed out dark shapes on the roof that moved a few feet before melting back into the shadows. Sentries, Follett said, but there are no sentinels for dreams. Follett drove for a few blocks before parking the caddy. Follett and Mary got out and snuck back to the convention center. It sat on a big four-lane street with its long side flanking the Ostanula River. Follett led Mary to a low hedge across the street from the building, big building and sat down on the cool, wet grass. Mary nestled into Follett's lap in warm embrace to await the assault. They didn't have long to wait. It seemed like a soft breeze at first. The tops of the trees swayed. Then Follett noticed that the breeze that was blowing toward the massive brick and block structure was softly infused with colors red, white, black, and a color that was somehow without color. Wisps and threads and strands of broom flowed toward the sleeping construction. And then from within, almost inaudibly at first, Follett heard something. One and then more soft and then becoming louder until all at once a door flew open and one and then another and then a dozen and then more people ran screaming out of the building. But none of these affrighted were the dreamers. The ones who ran seemed not to realize that they were still sleeping night terrors, the dreams no one remembers, and then quiet. And Follett saw the golden one and her eight brothers and sisters softly glide to the building. But the woman was wearing a crown of stars nestled and in, melted inside. A few more minutes passed, and a second exodus of terrified souls bolted from the building, pushing and shoving each other out of their way. Their only thought was to save themselves from dreams of the end of the world. But these were not all of the captors. Finally, Phobator's white-robed daughter walked to the front door. She threw her arms out, and the doors opened to admit her. She walked in, calmly and serenely, and the doors closed behind her. Minutes later, the front doors were pushed barely open. A man crawled out of the building, stumbled to his feet, and staggered off away, just away. A second fell through the door, landing on his back, and rolled to his hands and knees, pushed himself up, and tottered away. Five minutes passed, and a third man stuck his head out of the door, threw up and stood up shakily. He turned around, a terror-stricken look on his face, and when he tried to run, his foot slipped in his vomit and his feet flew out from under him. He hit his head on the concrete sidewalk. He lay still for a few seconds and then crawled away from the building in its greatest fears. He managed to get to his feet after five or six yards and swayed with faltering steps. That was all who had decided to leave. 
Fifteen minutes later, followed heard a tiny sound, and then another, and then another, and then another. Mice or a cat, or a herd of cats, a fog of little cat's feet, so silent that unless he had expected them, Follett would have missed them. Follett saw them, or he thought that he did. He wasn't exactly sure what he saw. The shapes of these beings changed from mouse to cat to pig to dog to snake. Follett was almost certain that he saw a number of small white butterflies. But each animal wore a tiny little cap, his or her tarn cap, the cap that gave the creature invisibility. They evaporated into the building through a hundred different openings. And then the screaming began. Agonizing, piercing howls, anguished wails, tortured screeches, heartbreaking shrieks, and the outcries became muffled, suppressed, and quietly strangled. The murae were doing their work, and then it was quiet for a few minutes. And then one, and then a handful, and then a dozen came to the door, followed heard shouts from inside, Stop! And then more and more, and still more people dressed in their bedclothes, t-shirts, pajamas, or even just a bikini bottom, a man and a few women. Whatever they had been wearing when they were taken came to the door and took flight from their captivities. Some helped others, but all seemed to have escaped when a tall, elderly man wearing a long red robe lurched to the doorway and shouted, Damn you! Damn you all! No, sir, Follett thought. Damn you! And he took Mary by the hand and led her back to the caddy.